hello everyone for the second week of the course of networks. So just as a reminder, last week what we've been doing mostly is to, uh, to refresh what I believe to be important concepts for the rest of this course. And today what we're going to do is finally to jump into the concept of networks and graphs. In this first video for this week, well, let's focus on the basics of graphs, very basic concepts that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of the week and of the next few weeks. So what is a graph or what is a network? Well, okay, perfect. So a network is a system made of nodes connected by links. Okay. So you have a, and uh, the thing is that typically in the literature, you have different ways to call the same things. And the network is sometimes called a graph. Nodes are sometimes called vertices. And links are sometimes called edges. And it's going to depend on the field of science where you are navigating. In pure math, people tend to talk more about graphs, vertices, edges. In the more applied math, people will use networks, nodes, and links. But these are just the same object. So mathematically, we'll have that a graph or a network is, co is going to be seen as a combination of two sets. A graph or a network is basically the combination of a set of V, a set of nodes, and E, a set of edges. So V is a set of nodes, the set of your elements, and E is a set of edges. Now, for the rest of this course, I'm going to be trying to keep the same notations. And I'm going to say that the cardinality of V, the number of nodes, is going to be equal to N. And the cardinality of E, uh, which is the number of edges, is going to be written by big M. Okay? Now, edges are not any kind of elements. What they need to be is basically pairs of nodes. Basically means that any element of E, a small edge, is going to have the form V, V prime, where V and V prime belongs to the set V. And this basically would be an edge of a graph, right? For an edge to, to be defined, it needs to be connecting two nodes, and these two nodes need to exist, obviously. Yes. Now, in the case of unweighted, uh, of undirected networks, the ordering VV prime, V prime, V doesn't make any difference. Uh, in contrast, if you have a directed network where the direction plays a role, then the edge VV prime will be different from the edge V prime V. <coughs> now there's another important thing that needs to be said before we continue is, so here, in the way the graph is defined, this would be corresponding to an unweighted network. There are no weights. Either the edge exists or it doesn't exist. Yeah? Now, in certain situations, you would like to be able to, you, you would like to define a weight on edges. You could think, for instance, of road networks, where on a certain road segment, you would like to, for instance, account for the capacity of that road segment. Yeah. Well, if you want to do so, then typically what you do is to define a weight function. And this weight function is going to be a function of, for, such that for any edge, you assign it a certain real number. Now, the thing is that in practice, and in most practical, uh, yeah, in mo most practical applications, <coughs> this weight is going to be assumed to be a strictly positive number. It means that when you have a weight function, well, actually, that's going to be a function that goes from the set E to the positive numbers. Why so? Well, there are many reasons. The first one is that typically weight is understood as a measure of importance, and a, and a notion of importance is something that basically is definitely positive. But also because many of the concepts that are defined for graphs generalize very easily in the case of positive weights, while the generalizations is much more tricky and you need to be a bit more careful in situations when you account for negative weights. So it means that as of now, we will only have positive weights if we have a weighted network. 
Okay, so now, okay, so once you have a graph, well, typically if you, you will need some data structure in, your, in order to manipulate that graph. <coughs> and there are typically different ways by which you can encode a graph. One of the most common one, and one that's going to be re, that's going to be extremely useful in this course, is an object that that is called the n times n adjacency matrix. <coughs> and here, that's basically a matrix, and, and typically denoted by A, such that it's equal to one if I is adjacent to J and equal to zero otherwise. Okay, so so here let's just take a small example. Hop. So this is a very simple example here. We have a graph where the number of nodes is equal to five, the number of edges is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. So it means the adjacency matrix is going to be a five times five matrix. And that matrix, if you, if you write it, it's going to be zero, zero, one, one, one. And then we'll have zero, 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 one. And then one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, 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 zero. And indeed, well, clearly, the whole structure of the graph is perfectly encoded in this adjacency matrix. Yes. Now, <coughs> something that can be observed is that clearly the matrix we have here is, well, there is no element on the diagonal, which makes sense because we don't have self loops. We don't have links that connect nodes to themselves. Yes. But also, this matrix here is a diagonal, uh, it's a symmetric matrix which makes sense because the graph that we have is, uh, uh, is undirected. So here, in the, it, it very much makes sense that when you have an undirected network, we will basically confront it to matrices, adjacency matrices that are symmetric matrices. And we'll see that that's gonna be something very useful uh, when we're gonna be looking at the spectral properties of these matrices. In contrast, if we were to be confronted to a directed network, we would be basically having to manipulate adjacent symmetries that would be, in this case, asymmetric. Okay. Now, the, uh, the use of adjacent symmetries to represent this work is, is a very popular choice. And one of the reasons why people like to use it is that it naturally comes up when you think of a graph as a medium on which some dynamics takes place. And we'll see that when we look at linear dynamics, a lot of the linear dynamical properties can be understood from the properties of the adjacency matrix or another matrix related to it. Another very important aspect of it is that when you have matrices, it directly connects you to linear algebra and you can use all of the powerful tools from linear algebra. And what we'll see is that actually the knowledge that is encoded into the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of these matrices is going to be helping us to reveal some important structural features that are hidden in the graph. So those would be two reasons why people like to use HSNC matrices. Now there's just one problem though, is the fact that that matrix, if we don't, yeah, if we don't think about it carefully, well, that's going to be a matrix where we're going to be having mostly zeros on each line in, in many real life networks. You can think of Facebook again. So Facebook is, an, is a graph of about 1 billion uh, nodes. So um, as a matrix, that would be a 1 billion times 1 billion matrix. <coughs> and on each line, the number of zeros is simply the number of friends that the person has. Typically, a person has about 1,000 friends. So it means that only 1,000 out of the 1 billion entries will be different of zero, and all of the others are going to be equal to zero. So clearly, this is not an efficient way to encode the graph. So it means that in practice, people don't use agency matrices, but they think of the graph by it because it helps you then to connect to tools from linear algebra. And when you have really to, to try to do some matrix uh, manipulation 
on graphs, then instead of using uh, matrices, you can use uh, an object, a computational object called a sparse matrix that basically tries to well, basically tries to 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 encode only the positions where the entries are different from zero. So okay, so that would be the adjacency matrix, and we'll be using it quite a lot in the rest. Another way by which you can through which you can encode a graph is a, a very computational way that is usually called a edge list or link list. Link list, and in a link list. All you do is simply you 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 encode the sequence of all the edges that are present in your graph. So here you have m edges, m pairs. Well, your link list is simply given by this object here. And again, this is something that encodes exactly the structure of the whole graph. Now clearly, this is a structure that is not as beautiful mathematically, but it's extremely practical. And actually in practice, and you will be asked for your practical courses to download some data of networks. Very often when you download data of networks, those data are going to be encoded in a form that looks like this. You're going to be having a list of all of the edges that are present in your system. Now, just to go back to the previous example, in the example here, the graph would have been encoded as, so one is connected to three, one is connected to four, one is connected to five, uh, da, da, da. we have that three is connected to four, three is connected to five, and two is connected to five. Yeah. And indeed, this is a valid way to encode the whole graph. Now, as I said, so linked lists are, are not as beautiful as adjacency matrices, but sometimes they can be quite useful in algorithms. And for instance, in situations when you want to do some link randomization, or, situa or situations when you want to sample links randomly in a system, well, clearly having a structure that encodes all of these links in a sequen sequ sequential way is going to be a very efficient, efficient way to do so. Okay, so so that was the first video where well, basically we've been just showing the ways to encode a graph like this one. In the next video, we, we're going to be looking at ways to measure some interesting properties that may be hidden in these graphs. So, so in this second video of the week, let's look at a first important property of graphs. And this property is something called the degree distribution. So first of all, what is the degree? Well, the degree is the number of links incident to a node. Of links incident to a node. So for instance, let's take this small example here. We'd be having that this node is degree one, 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 three, yeah? And clearly we would expect that nodes that are more important have higher degrees, yes? And that's the degree would be a good proxy for the importance of a node. Now, typically the degree is denoted by Ki, and it's trivial to obtain it from the adjacency matrix. It's going to be equal to a sum over the j's going from 1 to n of aij, or similarly, sum for j going from 1 to n of aji. Yep. So here I've been assuming that I have a graph that is uh, undirected. The adjacency matrix is symmetric. And we can obtain the degree simply by summing on the lines or summing on the columns in order to count how many elements are different from zero on the lines associated to a node i. <coughs> the degree simply counts how many links are present around that node. Now, <coughs> uh, typically the degree is going to be distributed in, in certain ways. There is just one very, well, 
There's just what, what, one case when things are, uh, are different, that would be the situation when the graph is regular. We say that a network is regular, If all the nodes have the same degree and that ki is, is equal to a certain k. So if all of the nodes have exactly the same value of the degree, we say that the graph is regular. But as we'll see in practice, we'll observe that the situation is very, very different from that that actually we're going to be having a lot of variability in that degree. Now, this was for undirected networks. If you start to have directions, then you need to, yeah, to generalize a bit this concept of degree. And in the case of directed networks, there are typically two different ways by which you can uh, capture the, 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 the links coming in or going out of, of, an, of a node. And those would be the out degree and the out degree that we typically write k i out simply counts how many links are leaving a node. So in this case, that would be an out degree of three, yes. And you would also have the in degree that basically counts the number of links that are arriving on a node and that we write ki in, in this case, that would be a new degree of uh, four, because four edges are arriving on this node i. Yeah. Now, <coughs> the thing is that, uh, well, again, in practice, in, in and out degrees can be important, depending on the data that you have, but here, especially for, 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 the, for, for the rest of this video, will be focusing on undirected networks exclusively. Now, the thing is that in principle, nodes can take any degrees, right? You could have nodes of degree five, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. But actually not all combination of degrees is possible in a graph. And there is a result that is usually called the handshaking theorem. Well, you see that it's a very simple theorem. It basically shows you that there must be some, some, some constraints that need to be satisfied by the, the degrees of a graph. And this simply comes from the fact that every time you have an edge, yeah, this edge connects two nodes, yes, and it's going to be contributing a value of one to the two extremities, to the two nodes at its extremities. This, this, is, this is going to be implying that if you do a sum for i going from 1 to n of all of your degrees, yeah, well, if you do so, what you will basically have is that this is the same as the sum for i going from 1 to n, j going from 1 to n of a i j. And clearly, in your matrix, if you sum all of your elements, you're going to be summing twice the same edge. Yes, because the same edge appears twice. And basically it means that this is going to be equal to two times m. So what does it imply? It implies that if you sum all of, the, all of your degrees, you have twice the number of edges. It, it also means that <coughs> if you have degree sequences, they cannot take any values because we need to have the sum of all of the numbers is an even number. And that's basically the essence of this handshaping theorem that tells you that the sum of the degrees of all, all of the nodes of a graph is basically a neither number. Okay? Perfect. So now, okay, so we have the degree. And the degree is a way to, yeah, to, to, to characterize somehow the nodes in a graph. Now, and this basically resonates from what we did last week. Uh, once you have the degrees, you can then calculate an histogram of your degrees, the frequency of your degrees. And if you do so in empirical data, but basically you will observe that in many empirical data sets, so here what basically what you have is always the degrees. And this is the fact that these are the frequencies at which they are observed in different data sets. And you observe that 
This is not something that would look like a regular graph. If we were to have a regular graph, we'd basically have a peak, right? All of the nodes would be exactly at the same value. What we have is something that is completely different. Where we have very high degrees, the order of 10,000 here, but also a lot of them having a very small degree, which is something that resembles a power law distribution that we've been seeing last year. So it means that very often when people try to, to fit the degree distribution of a graph, they, would, they will be trying power laws <coughs> with a cutoff, as we discussed last week, as a first way to try to fit, the, to, to explain the, the, the degree distribution that is observed in real life networks. Now, the degree distribution, as we'll see, is a very important concept because this is something that's, that's, uh, that can really explain a lot of how fast or slow diffusion takes place on a graph. And why is that? Well, if we have such a broad degree distribution, it means that we have certain nodes that are extremely connected. Those would be extremely connected hubs in your graph. And these hubs are going to be creating shortcuts and helping the diffusion to diffuse extremely fast inside your system. So it means that when you have such high degrees, we would expect basically the diffusion to be extremely fast. And this is something that we're going to be exploring when we, looked at, when we look at dynamics on, uh, on networks later on in, in, in the next few weeks. Now, associated to the notion of, uh, of the degree distribution, there is actually a very interesting and, and funny uh, observation. And this funny observation is something called the friendship paradox. Friendship paradox. Paradox. So what does this uh, friendship paradox say? It tells you something that looks to be, yeah, very frustrating actually, and, and that some of us may have been yeah, experiencing in their life. Uh, is the fact that if, if you consider your number of friends, let's say I have maybe 50 friends, and you ask the question, on average, do your friends have more friends than you have? Well, the thing is that actually, yes. So on average, your friends have more friends than you have yourself, which looks a bit like uh, these uh, says that uh, the lawn is going to green at your neighbors, right? In that case, I guess that's, that wouldn't be something that wouldn't be verified mathematically. But in the case of the friendship paradox, it can be verified, actually. And we're going to be showing now that indeed, on average, your friends will have more friends than you have. I'm sorry for you. So how do we do with that? Well, well first of all, let, let's take an, like a graph. We don't even need to consider exactly who's connected to who. So this is a graph where we have a certain node that is going to be one, fourth, one, one, two, three, and so on, right? And the first thing that you are interested in would be the average degree. The, the average number of friends of a person. So, and if I, if I have the degree distribution, this is simply obtained by doing a sum over the k's of k times p of k. Yeah. In the example that I have here, all I need to do is calculate one six, I have six nodes, and then I sum all of my degree, uh, all, all, all all of the degrees of all of the nodes. And this is going to be equal to two. So it means that on average, if you take a person on average uh, at random, that person is going to be having two friends on average. Yeah? So now what we want to do now is to compare. What we have is the average number of friends of a random person. What we want to do now is to calculate what is the average number of friends of the friend of an average person. Yep. And when you do so, well, clearly it's going to be leading to a bias in the way we're going to, we're going to be calculating our, our average. Why is that? Well, if you think of node number four, for instance, node number four is four times more likely to be the friend of someone than is, for instance, this node here, right? Which basically means that when we'll be looking 
at the average number of friends of a friend, it'll be appearing four times more often in the average. And indeed, if you calculate the, this, the, the resulting weighted average, what you're going to be having is something where the node one appears once, node two and contributes a value of one, a, a, degree, a node with degree two appear, appears twice more, contributing to a value of two, node three appears three times more often, and then one, and then four times four, then plus one times one. <coughs> and we just need then to calculate by, to divide by, we have a weighted average by the sum of the weights, which is, would be equal to one plus two plus three plus one plus four plus one, which when we do the math is going to be equal to 2.67, which is indeed larger than the two. And Basically, basically, it simply means here that because of this bias sampling, we give more importance to the high degree nodes, and hence we basically have that the average number of friends of a friend are going to be larger than the average number of friends of a random person. Yeah. So this is the formula that comes from this example. If now we were to do it like above, uh, given a certain degree degree distribution would get that average k of a friend would be equal to, would do again a weighted average. So this is really poorly written. So something like this, the sum of the k's, and then we sum of the k's and we do k p of k divided by the sum of the k primes of k prime P of k prime. Uh, yep. Yep. And if we are actually rearrange the terms, we observe that this is equal to the average of k square divided by the average of k. And well, clearly, from some basic notions in statistics. We know that average of k square divided by average of k is going to be larger or equal to the average of k. Hence the Frenching paradox. And we only have an equality when the average uh, of k square, well, actually, we only have equality if average of k square is equal to average of k to the square, which basically happens when all of the nodes have the same value, the distribution is peaked at a certain value, and we basically have a regular graph. So it means here that as soon as we have a graph that is not regular, we will not have uh, this equality, and we'll have that if we sample the nodes, not randomly, but by taking random friends of someone taken randomly, we we'll tend to find higher degree nodes. We we'll tend to find nodes that have a higher values of, uh, of, of that degree. Now, actually, this is something that, that is used sometimes in practice for vaccination. When you want to vaccinate and you just have a certain a small number of, <coughs> of uh, vaccines, you want to try to, to vaccine the important people. One way to do is to take people at random, to ask them to name a friend, and then to to, vac to vaccinate that friend. Well, from what we've be, we've seen we've been seeing today, we, we're going to be having that on average, this sampling procedure, where you take a random friend of someone taken at random, is going to be leading to nodes whose degree is on average higher, and hence we may, we may hope that the vaccine is going to be more efficient once these people are going to be vaccinated. But that's some, something that doesn't really, uh, uh, well, that's something quite important these days, obviously, but that's not exactly the subject of this video. So thanks a lot. And yeah, so in the next video, we'll be looking now at uh, going beyond the links and we'll go through the notions of walks and paths in graphs. So hello everyone for this third video of the week. 
So after focusing on the degree and the degree distribution, we'll be looking at something that is really a critical uh, ID in networks and graphs. And that's this ID that when you have edges, well, you can combine them together in order to form walks and paths that allow you to connect indirectly pairs of nodes that are not directly connected, but through these combinations of edges, give you some indirect way to go from one node to another one. So let's let's go. So what is a woke? Well, a woke is a succession. So let me first write it down. A woke is a succession, succession of adjacent nodes such that you can travel from one in initial node to a final node. So for instance, this, let, let's take, this graph, I don't know, I provide it here. And well, we could have that I start from this node, I go like this, I go like this, I go here, I came back where I came from, I continue like this, I continue here, and so on until I arrive at the final node. And so clearly, even if this first node here and that second one here were not directly connected with each other, <coughs> well, actually, we can uh, find a combination of uh, edges that are going to be helping us to connect indirectly one node to another one. Now, the thing is that um, there are different types of walks, and among the walks, there is a certain type that is very important, and that's an, a walk called a path. So, a path is a walk where each node is visited only once. So for instance, this example here was not, was not a path because I've been going twice through that node here. So if I wanted to find a path that go from the origin to the destination, I could go from here to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. That would be a proper path because I never visited any node more than once, okay? So, walks and paths are extremely important for different reasons. Typically, for diffusive dynamics, we'll see that walks naturally appear. So, as soon as uh, very often when, when we deal with linear dynamics, we'll see that actually the linear dynamics propagates along the walks that are basically compatible with a certain graph. But in practice, in, in many other practical situations, we we'll basically have that the uh, not all, not all of the walks are followed equally likely and in many situations we are only interested in the show the short walks and actually it's not so difficult to show that the shortest walk between two nodes is a path that's not so surprising right if i have a shortest walk clearly i cannot go twice through the same node because that would be a waste and it's relatively easy to show that the shortest walk is a path and there are many problems where you're interested in looking the sh for the shortest path between any pair of nodes in a system. A good example would be for routing purposes, for instance. You want to find the best way to go from Oxford to London. Well, that would be done by trying to find the shortest path in the street network going from where you are now to, uh, to your destination. So it means that walks and paths have different applications but both of them are extremely important because they convey this, 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 this notion that you can, even if the whole graph is not fully connected, you can find indirect ways to go from one point to another one by combining incidence edges. <coughs> now, there are many things that are not, uh, known about walks and paths. For instance, in the case of walks, it's not too difficult to show that the number of uh, walks 
between a certain node i and a certain node j is directly obtained from the adjacency matrix. Wait, the number of walks of length L. So if I'm, if I'm interested in how many walks of length L exist between node i and j, I take the adjacency matrix to the power L, I look at the element ij, and this gives me that number. So that's something that is again relatively easy to show. It's a classical result. You can go and have a look at it in, in some standard books of graph theory, for instance. Now, I think the path is something that is a bit more tricky. Even if, again, there are some very good uh, algorithms you know, to find shorter paths and graphs. Now, uh, the thing is that a path defines a very important notion in a graph, and especially the shortest path. And that's the notion called the distance. We have that the distance, or the shortest path distance between i and j is the smallest number of steps to go between i and j. And actually, it's also the length of the shortest path between i and j. And it's usually called d of i j. Of course, there could be situations when, let's assume that I have a graph like this. This is my i, this is my j. Well, if there is no path that go from i to j, in that case, we would say that the distance between i and j would be equal to infinity by definition. Now, now this distance actually well, satisfies all of the axiom, axioms that the proper distance should be verifying. So it's not too difficult to show that this distance is non-negative, with the d of i j is a positive number. It satisfies the notion of coincidence in the sense that d of i j is equal to zero if and only if i is equal to j. It uh, has symmetry at least for undirected networks. We have that the distance from i to j is equal to the distance from j to i. And finally, it satisfies the triangular inequality. The distance from uh, i to j is smaller or equal to the distance from i to l plus the distance from l to j. Okay? Now, in order to find the distance, you need to find the shortest path between two nodes. Luckily, there is a very efficient algorithm to find the shortest path between any pair of nodes in a graph, which is called the Dijkstra's Dijkstra algorithm, which is again a very classical result from graph theory. And I encourage you to go and have a look in the course of graph theory to discover what is this uh, Dijkstra algorithm. Okay, so, so to summarize, summarize, what do we have now? We have the notion of walk, the notion of path, right? And this notion of path defines the notion of shortest path, from which we can then calculate a, a measure of distance between any pair of nodes in a graph. Now, once you have such a measure of distance, where you can actually construct, construct some metrics to characterize a graph itself. One such is the average distance. The average distance in a graph, noted usually by L, it's equal to 2 divided by n times n minus 1. And then we have a sum. We have a sum for i going from 1 to n. And then we have j going from 1 to, oh, sorry for that, j going from 1 to i minus 1. Yes. And uh, the distance from i to j. Yeah? We simply look at all pairs of i, j, and we calculate the average value of the distance. And this is a number that can be used to characterize a graph. 
Another one that is directly related to it would be the diameter. The diameter is like, is simply given by the maximum for any u and v in the set of nodes of the distance of u and v. So instead of looking for the average distance, we take the maximum distance between any pair of nodes in the system. Now, actually, this this notion of uh, average distance leads to to some well to 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 to, to a concept that is surprising initially but not so much when you think about it uh, a bit more and that's the concept of small world networks so actually this is a notion that is not new it's when well, there is a say that what a small world right and you say that usually when you find like unexpected connections to people that Initially, you didn't, you didn't have any idea that you might know even indirectly. And <coughs> this, this, uh, this concept was explored sociologically for the first time by a sociologist called Milgram, who in the 1950s, 60s, decided to, to try to measure the average distance between any pair of people in the world. And what he observed uh, in his experiments was that actually most pair of people were not separated by a chain longer than six. So a chain longer than six looks very small, right? Because it really means that uh, what you have is <coughs> that even if the graph is huge, even if the graph is made of billions of individuals, you can find extremely short walks or short, short path between any pair of these nodes. Now, in, in, in its exper initial experiments, Milgram did it by asking people to send letters only to their friends and asking their friends to try to send it to someone who would be a target. And well, of course, that was the way technology allowed to do these experiments at the time. Now, these days, uh, you can do it just by looking at, at, at Facebook. And this is the result from an experiment done on Facebook where some Facebook researchers have been doing, doing an histogram, where here what you have is the x-axis is the average degree of separation of people, and you have an histogram. And you, what you observe is that the vast majority of the people tend to, to be basically separated by chains that are extremely small, smaller than four. So it means that even if the graph is huge, I mean, there are billions of elements, actually there exist many, many sh shortcuts, many short paths that allow you to go from one place to the graph to the other part of the graph. And in this case, it basically tells you that most pairs of people are separated by distance that is less than five actually which is extremely short so we'll see the reason why why we would expect such shortcuts uh, in one of the next videos but that's something that directly comes when you try to think first about this notion of distance in graphs <coughs> very good so now okay so so we have this notion of distance with the notion of small world so once once you have it well actually uh the, this notion defines a relation that is a relation of connectedness. Connectedness. And in this notion of connectedness, which is actually a, a relation of equivalence, well, we're going to be saying that two nodes are connected if there is a path that exists between them. So for instance, here we have a graph where Well, all the nodes in this component, and this component is called the connected component, all of these nodes are connected with each other. All of those nodes are connected with each other. And we have a graph that is actually composed of two connected components. Now, in the case of uh, undirected networks, we, we can simply think of the graph as 
a combination of these connected components. When we know I have a graph that is directed, directed things can start to be a bit more difficult. And typically there are, in the case of directed networks, there are two notions. So for directed networks, there are two notions. There is a notion of strong connectivity and the notion of weak connectivity. We'll say that two nodes are weakly connected if they're connected by a path, but we, when we forget about the direction of the edges, or we say that a, a, a two nodes are strongly connected if they are connected, if I is connected to J and J is connected to I by path that are basically constrained by the direction of, of the edges. So of course, Strong connectivity implies weak connectivity. Now, what, once you're confronted to, to well, as we said, when you're confronted to connected uh, to undirected networks, the graph can be seen simply as a combination of connected components. Once you're dealing with directed networks, things are a bit more tricky. And in that case, you can also have some sort of sketches of the organization of graphs. And that would be the kind of, uh, sketches that you have this is a visualization of the web where the core the core here is a strongly connected component <coughs> meaning that from any point in here i can go to any point there and back yeah but actually we also have other components that naturally come from this notion of strongly connected component we have the out components those would be all of the nodes that can be reached from the strongly can, uh, from the core, but you cannot go back to it. You have the in component that are all the nodes that are such that you can reach a strongly connected component from the in component, but you cannot go back. Okay, yeah. But you can also have these dendrites. Those would be nodes that are such that if you start from the in component, you arrive in the dendrite, but you cannot go back to the in component. And you can also have these other dendrites that go this way, basically. And you can see that suddenly when you have directed in the, in the directedness that is added to a graph, you enrich very much the way that you can, uh, by which you can describe a system. So to summarize, in this uh, third video of the week, well, the key elements were the notions of walks, path, distance, and connectivity. See you in the next video. So welcome everyone for, for this fourth video of the week. So in the last video, we've been introducing the notion of distance, which is indeed one way to, yeah, to, to measure if a graph tends to be small or large, right? Are there, do, do there exist short walks, short paths between any pair of nodes in the graph? In this uh, video, we'll be looking at other ways to measure some interesting information for a graph through the notion of clustering, measure, measuring the density of triangles in graphs, <coughs> and proposing different notions of centrality, helping us to find out what are the important nodes in a graph. So let's, let's start with the clustering coefficients. So the clustering coefficient. So, so the clustering coefficient is really an essential measure and it basically comes from the social sciences and it's usually understood as a notion of the cohesion that is present in a social network so ju just to give you an example of a situation so let's assume that you have a graph like this one here we would be having many open triangles in the sense that these nodes and that node are not directly connected, but they are connected by, by many paths of length two. Well, in the social sciences, we would be expecting that in the future, there's gonna be the formation of a triangle, uh, of a link here, leading to the formation of many triangles, <coughs> because it will help to relax a frustrated state. Situations when you have many open triangles are frustrated states, when you add just one single edge, it relaxes the system a bit like in spin glasses in physics, and the systems somehow arrives at a lower level of energy, if you wanna see it this way. So actually, this, uh, this idea of 
using open triangles as a way to predict where future edges would appear in the future is some is is a heuristic is a trick that people use very much in link prediction so link prediction is a task in network science where <coughs> given a graph at a certain time you try to predict what would be the edges that will appear in the future and were not present yet in the past and there are many ways by which you can try to solve that problem but and one of them is associated to this notion of cohesion social cohesion clustering coefficient and it basically consists in looking for pairs of nodes that belong to many open triangles that are not connected themselves and then to predict that those would be the, the ones that will be connected in the future and even if it's a very simple method well, it tends to work fairly well usually in practice so so in practice now how, how do you quantify the, the the density of triangles that could be present in a graph the, <coughs> the standard way to do so is to introduce a number that is denoted by ci that is the local clustering coefficient <coughs> and that's a measure that basically counts measures the abundance of triangles in the neighborhood a bar hood of node i we take a node i and we ask the question is this graph part of many triangles or not so many given the number of edges that are available around it well let's say that i have i and let's assume that i is three possible edges well there would be at the maximum one, two, three triangles to which this node i may belong. Yeah. And when you think about it, what would be the maximum number of triangles that could be embedded around the node i if that node i is a degree ki, ki? There would be a number of ki times ki minus one divided by two. These are all of the possible ways to form triangles between the ki neighbors of a node i. Given this, we have this definition of this coefficient ci. It's equal to the number of triangle, including node i, divided by ki times ki minus one, divided by two. <coughs> And so by definition, this is a number that is going to be larger than zero and small or equal to one. You know, close to one, it means that almost all of your neighbors are part of triangles. <coughs> when it's close to zero, it means that possibly you have many triangles, many neighbors, but none of them are unknowing each other. Yeah. So this number here, well, is usually defined at the node level and from there we can define a measure of the density of triangle inside the whole graph by looking at an average of it across the whole system and so we define a certain c which is equal to one of n times the sum of i going from one to n of ci and so it means that if we have a graph where the c is very high means that we tend to have many triangles inside that graph when, when the c is very small we tend to have a very small density of such triangles now actually th this notion of density of triangles is very much related to the to the to the to the question of the small world that we discussed in the last video and this is something that is uh, at the core of a very seminal and very influential paper that was published in the 1990s by Watts and Strogatz. So Watts and Strogatz were interested in trying to understand what would be the impact of structure and dynamics. And what fascinated them was the fact that in real life, networks tend to exhibit local order, but very short diameters. And here, actually, what they proposed in the paper was a very simple toy network where <coughs> 
they would have a parameter that would allow them basically to tune the local order and the local order would be characterized by the clustering coefficient while the uh, the size of the system and the impact of randomness would be uh, measured by the uh, average distance inside inside the graph and what was quite impressive was that so if i'm here i would have the c is large but the l is actually very large so it, it, it has very you it need you, you you need many steps to go from one part of the graph to the other one but your clustering coefficient is high at the same time here you would have the c is going to be small when the graph is too random but the average distance is very small but actually there, there was a region here where you could actually find that the c would be large so there would be many triangles a lot of local order and yet at the same time having the, the l is very small meaning that the average distance between any pair of nodes would be very small and basically there were they started to to investigate the properties of such a model where there would be this kind of combination between local order captured by the clustering coefficient and at the same time the power of shortcuts allowing you to connect different parts of the graph in a very small number of steps basically <coughs> so that would be for the uh, for the clustering coefficient now another uh, another problem that is very important usually when you confront it to graph is the one of centrality and for centrality what you try to do is to propose a simple way to rank nodes in terms of their importance you want to know what are the important nodes what are the less important ones you could think for instance that you're an advertiser you have a certain, a certain number of pounds to use in order to do some targeted advertisements but you would like to know who are the central individuals in your social network it will basically be the ones to connect in order to ensure that your message is going to be propagating, for instance. Now, for centrality, the simplest way to, to estimate the centrality of nodes is the degree centrality. And the degree centrality is simply the degree. So you say that a node is important if it's connected to many nodes. Yeah. Now, the thing is that, of course, that seems to be a very simple method. Maybe there would be other ways to do so. One such other way is something called the closeness centrality. And the closeness centrality is defined as follows. So the closeness centrality, so closeness of node i is equal to n minus 1 divided by the sum for j different from i of the distance from i to j so what you do here you take one divided by the average distance of node i to all of the other nodes in the system and well clearly if this distance is small is this average distance is small it means that the node i well, let's assume that you have something like this we have node i if it's at the, at the center it tends to be close to all of the other nodes and hence one of our of the average distance is going to be large and we basically have that this node here is going to be a central node so in the case of closeness centrality now the notion of centrality is that a node is central if it tends to be close to all of the other ones inside the system yeah <coughs> so there is another notion that is also very popular between and used in practice and it's the notion of betweenness centrality and so let's write it down as betweenness of node i so i'll write it down for you here so it's equal to I'll first write it down um, and then sum for j different from i sum for l different from i to j minus one of sigma j l i divided by sigma j l. So what you do here is the following. So you take a node i and you wonder about the following. So is this node i part of, ma of many shortest paths between 
other other pairs of no or, or, or the pairs of nodes in the system. So here, what you do is you're going to be taking all pairs J L that are different from node I, and for that one, you're going to be looking for the shortest path, and there could be one shortest path like here, going from J to L, another one like here, and possibly a third one that goes through node I, right? And then you will say that this uh, pair J L contributes to the betweenness centrality of node i and it's going to contribute in this case of a value of one third because sigma j l i counts how many of the shortest paths between j and l are passing through node i while sigma j l is the total number of shortest paths going between j and l and in our case it would be one divided by three and you do that for any pair of nodes in the system. But clearly here, that would mean now that a node is central if it tends to be in between, if it tends to be part of the shortest path between any pair of nodes in the system. And what would be the kind of situations where that would be the case? Well, let's assume that we have a graph like here, for instance. And we, and we wonder about an, a node like this one here. Well, this node is a very small degree, degree of two. But we can be sure that all of the shortest paths that go from the left to the right are going to be going through it, right? This node is very important because it, it's at a bottleneck. And hence, we would expect that the betweenness centrality will help us to reveal these nodes that are crucial for the information to go from one part of the graph to the other one. That's one of the reasons why people tend to use this betweenness centrality quite a lot. So we've seen degree centrality, closeness centrality, uh, uh, bet betweenness centrality, yes. Now, a fourth one that I would like to mention is, an, is a notion that is called the, the notion of cats centrality. So in the case of betweenness centrality, we only focus on the shortest path, right? But as I said in a few, uh, a few videos ago, actually there could be situations when not only the paths are important, but all of the walks might be important. And, the, and as you see that this is quite the case in the case of diffusive dynamics. But that's the reason why we can then try to say that a node is important if it tends to be part of many walks, defined in a way that is going to be clear in a second. So the way to do is the following. So we're going to be saying that we will be interested in uh, all of the walks in the system. And if you remember, a to the power L i j is the number of walks of length L between i and j. And what we say is that between i and j, <coughs> well, clearly we would expect that the shorter walks should be more important than the longer, longer ones, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be scaling the, the importance of each walk by a sector of certain factor alpha uh, that will be taken to the power L. Will alpha between zero and one. And what we'll say is that we're going to be defining somehow a measure of the connectivity between node i and j as identity, which is a to the power zero, plus alpha a, plus alpha square a square, plus and so on. And you see here that you give more importance to the lower powers, to the shortest walks, and less importance to the longer walks. Now, this series here well, is going to be converging if we take alpha to be sufficiently small. Yeah. And when is that the case? We're going to, it's going to be converging when alpha is chosen to be smaller than the inverse of the largest eigenvalue of a. So we need to take alpha smaller than the larger second value of a, and then we'll have that the series converges. 
we have that this whole expression is going to be given by this here. Now, given this expression that tells you about the connectivity between I and J, giving more importance to the short works than to the longer ones, we say that the importance of node I now, well, it's going to be simply given by a sum for J going from 1 to N of identity minus alpha A minus 1 IJ. So we count, basically, from node I, all of these weighted sums for all of the Js. And we say that node I will be, will be important in the sense that it tends to be part of many works and preferably of shorter works yeah, if this number here is going to be a large number. Okay, And this is a big difference with the previous case of the between the centrality is that we don't restrict ourselves to the shortest part. We look at all of the works given, giving, it's true, more importance to the short ones than to the longer ones. Now, actually, before we, we conclude this video, there would be another method that is very important. It is something called page rank. <coughs> so actually, page rank is going to be something where we're going to be discussing in detail when we look at random works on graphs. So I will not say too much about it now. I just want to give you just like uh, a, a taste of the philosophy behind it. So in the case of page rank, we will say that a node is important when it receives connection from important people. So it means that, let's assume that I'm a certain person here. If I receive connections from people who are not important, actually, I will not be an important person. But if instead I receive connections from people who are very important themselves, it will mean that I will also become myself important. And you see that this is some sort of like a circle argument, right? I'm important if I receive connections from important people. And this is a problem that's when we're going to be formalizing it, takes the form of an eigenvector and eigenvalue problem. But clearly, this is something that very much makes sense in a practical setting, because well, if you want to decide whether or not someone is important, let's say on Twitter, well, of course, its number of followers is going to be something important. But not all of the followers are equally important. And if you are followed by Barack Obama, for instance, clearly, this carries more weight than you were to be followed by yeah, someone like me, for instance. Okay. So, so that would be about page rank. And so for page rank, we're going to be looking at it in a few weeks when we look at uh, random walks. But just to summarize, in this video, we've been interested in the notion of triangles and clustering. And we've been going through a small number of measures that exist in order to, to, to capture the centrality of nodes in graphs. So this is already the last video of the week. And in this video, we'll look at some first uh, notions associated to the spectral properties of graphs. So as we've discussed, you can represent a graph by its edges and symmetrics. And in the case when the graph is undirected, that matrix will be uh, symmetric. And this will induce some nice spectral properties about it. But not only this, is, this, this will not only be the case for the HSN symmetries, but also for other matrices that will, that will re reveal to be important when we'll be trying to uncover some interesting structural properties from spectral properties. So well, let's have a look. So typically, when you, when you have a graph, the, the most important matrices to represented would be the adjacency matrix AIJ. AI AJ is equal to one if there is an edge between I and J zero otherwise, right? But then there are two other matrices that are quite important. The first one is the Laplacian matrix, sometimes called the combinatorial Laplacian. The other one being the normalized Laplacian matrix. So the first one is 
Lij is equal to Ki times delta Ij, where delta Ij is just the Kronecker function, right? Minus Aij. And this one here would be Lij tilde equal to delta Ij minus Aij divided by the square root of Ki times Kj. So the Laplacian matrix and the normalized Laplacian matrix will appear naturally, as you'll see, when you look at random walks, consensus dynamics, and graphs. These are extremely important concepts. And, and actually, when you think about it, they can be seen as some discrete versions of the standard Laplacian that you know from calculus. Yeah? So if you go from the continuous space to a discrete space, naturally the way to transform the Laplace operator into a discrete operator is through this Laplacian matrix. Now, as you see, there are not only one, but different types of Laplacians that can be defined. And the reason for that is that different Laplacians can be defined depending on the way that they manage the heterogeneity that's present in the graph. And indeed, if you have a graph that is regular, where all of the nodes have the same degree, you will basically have that these two matrices here will be essentially equivalent to each other. But when you, when you have a graph where the degrees may be different uh, between different nodes, you need to make a choice on the importance that you give to the different nodes, and you can arrive to different, yeah, different expressions for the Laplacians. Very good. So, so just in matrix form, we basically have that the Laplacian is equal to uh, identity, my, oh, sorry, mm, it's equal to the matrix D minus A, where the matrix D is a diagonal matrix, so you put the degrees on the diagonal, and you would have that the L tilde can actually be written as identity minus D minus one half, a d minus one half. Or again, this, this matrix where you put the, the, the degree on the diagonal. Now, uh, if the adjacency matrix is symmetric, L and L tilde are also symmetric matrices. Yes. So typically, when, when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with uh, a symmetric matrix, it will be such that its eigenvectors are going to be forming an orthonormal basis. Of the space. This is something that we'll be using quite a lot when we'll be having signals defined on nodes. And we'll actually be using this basis of eigenvectors of a proper matrix, Laplacian or HSNC matrix, depending on the case, <coughs> in order to simplify uh, our operations. Now, in general, when we have such a n dimensional vector, we'll have that this vector x will be equal to a sum for L going from one to N of AL times UL, but the UL would be the eigenvector of one of those matrices. And we basically have that the AL is obtained by projecting the signal onto the, uh, onto the elements of the basis. So it's gonna be equal to simply X and then you will, yeah. And this is something very trivial that you know, but this is something that we're gonna be using quite a lot later on when we'll be trying to understand signals on graphs. So, so typically for the adjacency matrix, well, just one more thing, when the case when the graph is uh, undirected and all of these matrices are symmetric, so as we said, the eigenvectors form a basis, but also the eigenvalues will be real numbers. Yes. Very good. So now for the adjacency matrix, it's customary to, so for adjacency matrix, it's customary to rank the eigenvalues for, uh, from lambda one. Wait, excuse me. Yep. To lambda n. For the Laplacians, we usually do it the other way around. Um, basically, we are, oh, sorry, 
I mean, the opposite. So, so actually for the adjacent symmetric, we rank them from the largest to the smallest. So lambda one is going to be larger or equal to larger or equal to lambda n. Sorry for that. For the Laplacian and the normalized Laplacian, we'll be writing them down differently. Lambda one smaller or equal to lambda two smaller or equal until lambda n. Now, in the case of the Laplacian and normalized Laplacian, there are a few simple facts that are quite important to, to keep in mind. The first one is that the multiplicity of lambda one here will tell you about the number of connected components. So if you have only one connected component, lambda one is unique, else it's gonna be, uh, there will be two equal, value, equal values, three means three connected components and so on. Something else that's quite important to know is that actually this lambda one is always equal to zero, meaning that we have basically that all of the eigenvalues are positive or zero, yes? And from what I said just before, we'll have that if we have one eigenvalue of zero, we have one connected component, two eigenvalues of zero, we'd have two connected components, three, three, and so on and so forth. Now, in the case of a connected graph where only lambda one is equal to zero, this lambda two here is something that usually plays a very important role. It's called the spectral gap. And the spectral gap basically tells you for dynamics, the time that it takes for some dynamics to, to spread inside the system and to cover it all and to reach stationarity. And typically when the lambda two is very small, it means that the system is very difficult to equilibrate basically. And when the lambda two is very large, it means that very rapidly, everything relaxes extremely fast inside the system. And the lambda two, as we'll see, it's going to be uh, an eigenvalue whose eigenvector carries a lot of information if you want to extract clusters in graphs, for instance. So what else uh, should I tell you? Well, actually, uh, there are many things that should be said. And so, so this eigenvector that's associated to the lambda 2 is typically called the Fiedler eigenvector. And as we'll see, the knowledge of that vector can really help us to, to find clusters and graphs. Now, there would be just one last tiny element that I would like you to, to keep in mind, is the fact that in the case of the normalized Laplacian, so we know that zero is equal to lambda one, smaller equal to lambda two, and so on, smaller equal to lambda n, which is itself small or equal to uh, two. And in this case, what we have is that we're gonna be having an equality. So we have the lambda n is equal to two only in the situation when the graph is bipartite. And it means that if we have a graph that is such that all of the connections are only between different types of nodes, But we don't have connections here. We don't have connections there. We only have connections across the groups. This is a bipartite graph. It is such that all of the cycles must be of even length. In that case, we can be sure that the lambda n is going to be equal to two. And that's the only case uh, when the, <coughs> the largest eigenvalue uh, of the normalized Laplacian be exactly equal to two. Otherwise, it's going to be smaller than two, basically. So, so these are very basic facts. But, but as we'll see, we'll be using these eigenvectors and these eigenvalues. We will also give a bit more justification on why does the Laplacian take such a form and why is it important in practical applications. But that would be something that we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you next week for the next video.